What's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Nathan Tolliver, and this is the pre-show by Kidogo. Uh, if you guys have had a great week, can I hear you guys make some noise? Yeah, it's been awesome. So welcome to Sunday. It's the last day of the World Discipleship Summits. We've had a little bit of technical issues, but it's been amazing. We've, uh, we're expecting roughly 8,000 people to be here today. You know, the fellowship, the classes, the worship, God has really been glorified during this week. And I believe on this final day of, this, of, the, of the summit, he will also be glorified. So for the next 30 minutes, or well, for the next few minutes, we're gonna be having some videos and some interviews. I hope that they inspire you and encourage you. Let's continue with the pre-show.
All right, I hope you've been enjoying the pre-show so far. Uh, right now, I've got a couple of guys with me that I'm really excited. We've got Justin Renton and Chris Ogbenaya. Uh, where are you guys from? Uh, from Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. Awesome. Now, tell me, how do you, I know you guys work together a lot. Uh, tell me about that. Uh, well, we've been part of the Africa D Group for about 20 years or more together. So it's been a, it's been a lifetime of friendship and partnership, you know, in winning Africa for Christ. Yeah, I mean, we have um, had opportunities to come together, you know, share our dreams together. I lead the church out there in West Africa, and uh, it's been great working and partnering with the other uh, African uh, regions. What are some of you guys' visions for Africa right now? So our long-term goal is a Bible talk within walking distance of every African. So that's our dream uh, and our lifetime ambition. And we're also trying to raise up evangelists and women's ministry leader to lead our numerous churches across Africa. That's awesome. Is there anything you guys want to say to everybody uh, while we're here? Uh, just, uh, yeah, just take away for the faith that you have and of course uh, Wakanda for, for life. <laughs> Wakanda forever. That's right. All right, thanks guys. We're going to continue with the pre-show.
All right, guys, we are nearing the end of our pre-show. Uh, right now, I'm standing here with Sherwin McIntosh. How you doing? Doing great. Great to be here. Yeah, he's had a long history with our movement. And uh, this is the man who wrote Men Who Dream. For those of you who don't know, uh, tell me a little bit about that song and some of the inspiration. Well, I w wrote that song with a couple of people. Steve Johnson and Noel Scott uh, worked on that song. It was 1989. We did it for the Boston conference up there. The title was Men Who Dream. We needed a theme song. We were inspired. Steve wrote some great lyrics. The cool thing has been to see how that song it's still popular. <laughs> it's like I'm an old man now, right? But uh, the teens love it. Uh, the young people love it. The college love it. Uh, it's just been cool to see how that lives on to the next generation. Wow, thanks, Sherwin. And I know that uh, you're about to start the service off, so let me hand you the mic. We're very excited today. We're going to be starting the service with a very special presentation. It's a surprise, so I can't tell you anything about it, but it's been worked on for a couple of weeks here, uh, mostly yesterday for 24 hours, uh, but we're putting it together. Uh, please uh, sit back, enjoy as we start our service today, renewed vision. Amen. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? Well, let that lonely feeling wash away. Maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay. That's why you don't feel strong enough to stand. You can reach, reach out your hand. And ooh, someone will come running. the dark comes crashing through when you need a friend to carry you and when you're broken on the ground you will be found so let the sun come streaming in cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again lift your head and look around you will be found you will be found And if you only say the word From across the silence, your voice is heard Even when the dark comes crashing through When you need a friend to carry you And when you're broken on the ground You will be found So let the sun come streaming in Cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again If you only look around Suddenly I see that all 
That was awesome! Good morning and welcome to the closing ceremony or service for Vision 2022. And for those of you online, you're with us. Welcome this morning. My name is Vince Hawkins. This is my wife, Robin. And uh, first of all, we want to say thank you, God. Thank you, Orlando Church. Thank you, Marshall Mead. And thank you all for being here. My wife is gonna share. Good morning, my brothers and sisters, my beautiful brothers and sisters. This is glorious. I wanna read Acts 2, 42 through 43, an oldie but goodie. The Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Brothers and sisters, we have experienced Acts 2.42 and 43 these past two weeks. It has been amazing. It has been amazing being together. We have heard some amazing lessons that have fed our souls, right? Like, it's been incredible. The fellowship has been electric. I mean electric. If you haven't been electrified, then just wait till the end of service. I'm Amen. sure you will be. Amen. The breaking of bread together, going in the hotel, seeing brothers and sisters eating and fellowshipping together has been glorious. It's been so incredible. And all the prayers lifted up for all of our brothers and sisters around the world calling on God to help us. It's just been incredible. As we close out this morning, worshiping our great and awesome God, I want to encourage you to let God wow you this morning. We are in for an, an amazing treat as we worship our great God together. You know, it's gonna be a few moments before the speaker comes up, but I do wanna go ahead and introduce him now. We're gonna stand for some incredible time of worship in just a moment. But we are very blessed to hear from one of the great orders in our fellowship. Our sermon this morning is gonna come from A.T. Ernison. A.T. and Marcy, they lead the Chicago church. It's a large church of over 2,000 disciples. The guy has incredible bandwidth. He's also the uh, chairman of our ICOC Catalyst team. He does so many other things but he is an amazing and gifted speaker. Got his undergrad degree in communications. He got a master's degree in rhetoric. He actually had a dream. He was a college wrestler. He had a dream to be maybe the first and maybe only ever 
professor in rhetoric and Division I wrestling coach. Pretty amazing, huh? But instead he went on and went into ministry, got a Bible degree in theology, a master's in Bible theology, and the guy is gifted. You are in for a treat this morning. A.T. is going to preach the Word. Now, it's going to be a little while before he preaches, but I just want to let you know we are in for a great treat. And we're going to sing and bring glory to God and lift up God and lift up one another in His presence. My wife's going to close or open us up with a prayer. Let's go. All right, brothers and sisters, let's bow our heads and pray to God. God, I, we love you, God, and we are so grateful to yes. be together. I pray, Father, that our worship this morning will put a huge smile on your face. Amen. Father, I pray that, you know, you are just glorified. Mm. Help us, God, to have our hearts completely open. Help our minds to be completely open to giving to you and to each other. Mm -hmm. Bless every aspect of the service. Feel Marcy, feel A.T. with your spirit. Uh, God, I pray that they will say exactly what we need to hear. We love you. Thank you for our worship team. I look forward, God, just to the rest of the service. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Turned into wine, open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you.
God is great. He is great. Now we're going to sing about Jesus. We're going to sing about Jesus. That's who it's all about. And there is nobody greater.
church.
Let's sing it one more time, then sings my soul. ourselves. 
into the World Discipleship Summit, some of us on shaky terms with our spouse or roommate, on shaky terms with the Lord, maybe some in this room right here, thoughts of suicide, thoughts of maybe, maybe just try a little drugs, you know, maybe experiment with this or that, it might help my spirit, I'm, I've been down, I've been we say to that, God will work it out. That's right. That's right. He's working right now. Yes. He's working right now. He's working right now. He's working right now. Do you hear us? He's working right now. He's working right now. He's working now. He's working right now. Oh, he's working right now. Can we sing that together? We say, God is working now. God is working.
Good morning, church. So great to be able to um, be here with you. My name is Dave Malutnok. I'm the president and CEO of Hope Worldwide, and I have the pleasure of serving uh, as the, in the executive leadership with Dr. Ben Barnett and um, so many amazing people that uh, work at Hope. We are uh, now at the, at the time of the worship service for our contribution time. And the um, grateful, we're so grateful for the conference organizers to allow us to um, have uh, this contribution benefit the work of Hope Worldwide. While we give a brief presentation, please scan the QR code on your phones or give, the give in the donation boxes in the back of the auditorium. And those of you that are online, you can scan the QR codes as well. But we appreciate the support that you've provided over the last 30 years. And we can't wait to see what the next 30 years have for us. I want to introduce, um, on my left, Matt Rollins. He is uh, the new manager of youth programs. Well, thank you, Dave. It is a great honor to be speaking with you guys and now to be part of Hope Worldwide. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. And he told them, the prayer started like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love that prayer because Jesus in the prayer is implying that there is a gulf that exists, a gap that exists between how things are in the world and how God created the world to be. God created the universe in a perfect state of shalom, of peace, of love, of harmony, and unity. And then we came along and we had very different ideas. You know what I'm saying? We kind of ruined it all. So um, <laughs> anyway, so we, his people, as we pray this prayer and participate in this prayer, are being called into the gaps that we see all over the world between how things are and how God wanted them to be. And into those gaps, we help to bring shalom and love and peace and kindness. That's one of our greatest callings as his disciples. That's our calling as his followers. And at Hope Worldwide, we are absolutely committed to developing our young people, whether it's millennials, if we're still considered young, I'm not sure, our Gen Zs, our college students, our high school students, and our children and our children's children into the kinds of people that bring shalom wherever they go. Whether those gaps are seen in momentary, turn of the moment disasters, or whether we see those gaps between how things are and how they ought to be in complex systemic community-wide challenges, we are committed to training and equipping our young people to be the kinds of people that step into those spaces with a message of shalom and hope. We do that through things like Hope Volunteer Corps, like the Hope Scouts programs that we have all around the nation. We do it through things like the North American Youth Advisory Council, through mentorship, through uh, education, through partnership with our amazing global family in the International Churches of Christ. So thank you for supporting us. And I just want you to know that when you give to Hope Worldwide, not just with your money, though we would certainly love that, with, but with your heart, with your partnership, with your time, with your humility, and with your willingness to walk with us into those gaps, I just want you to know that you are investing in a new generation of people who help to bring shalom wherever they go. So thank you for having us up here today. When COVID hit, disciples went into action, including corporate donations, over $2.5 million was given by you and other corporations to feed uh, 
provide meals, medical, personal necessities. Get this, to over 70 countries, over 250 of our churches globally, and help feed and clothe over 50,000 disciples around the world. Hope had a part of it, but it was you. On February 24, Ukraine faced enormous difficulties. Once again, disciples stepped in, and you gave $2 million for Ukraine relief. The Hope Worldwide team use those funds, along with the many partnerships that we've developed over the 30 years and have been cultivating. And we've, provide, uh, we've provided Ukraine with, to date, because we're not done yet, over $30 million worth of food, medical supplies, trauma supplies, psychosocial support, and in addition to um, the money and the hearts of the disciples in Western Europe, over 1,200 women, children, mothers, fathers, and many pets of all kind were given housing in 20 plus countries in Western Europe. Thank you, Hope Worldwide Germany, Hope Worldwide Great Britain. Uh, you, uh, along with our Ukraine brothers and sisters and the various churches in Europe, uh, just were amazing in coordinating uh, families and homes together. We're cur currently working on a partnership to significantly help with housing repairs for the marginalized populations of those homes that were damaged in Ukraine. Lastly, we've launched Lend Hope Worldwide. By, no, by donating to Lend Hope Worldwide, you will provide loans to disciples, their families, and other community members, giving them a chance to help themselves out of poverty in a respectful and honorable manner by being given a hand up, not a hand out. And once those loans are repaid, and we currently have about 200 loans uh, in process with 100%, almost 100% repayment, but once those loans are uh, repaid, they'll be recycled into other loans in the same country. So you give once, and that keeps recycling and recycling. Please remember that Hope Worldwide is a global network of member organizations. We have Hope Worldwide's registered in almost maybe over 50 countries. And during a pandemic year of 2021, with COVID spreading all over the world, with quarantining happening, globally there were over 18,000 volunteers giving 246,000 hours of service, transforming those volunteers as well as over 1.4 million beneficiaries. We thank you for all of the Hope Worldwide entities around the world. And if you've not already started the process, please find it in your heart to give uh, using the QR code or the clearly marked boxes in the back. We can only do this together, but we can create shalom. And we can help this world in spiritually as well as physically. Together, let's continue to make a difference for those in need. Thank you.
we stand, church? This is our song of declaration. We get a chance to sing over and over the attributes of God. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Come on, let's raise our voice. Yeah. 
be seated. We're going to take communion here in just a moment, but I did want to point out our keyboard here, uh, player Chase McIntosh, that guy gets into the worship. I don't believe he even touched the keyboards. He was just praising, amen. Communion. You know, I like to think of communion as this time when we come together and we sit around this massive table with Jesus. And we have this incredible fellowship with Jesus. And we have fellowship with God, but we also have fellowship with one another. And I believe that God looks down on our communion times. And he invites us because he's, he's, he's a hospitable God. And he brings us, he welcomes us to the table of fellowship. So this morning, we're going we're gonna to try to do something here, which is a little risky with this big crowd. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, it says everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And I don't know about you, but when, when I have dinner time with my family, we sit around, we, we sometimes talk. And I know getting a group like this to talk is challenging because then how do I get you to stop talking, right? But you're going to work with me this morning, amen? What I want you to do is I'm going to say a short prayer. And then I just want you to turn to the person next to you. And I want you to share one thing. One thing. One little thing where you're going to examine yourself and you want to walk away from here and go, you know what, this is something that I, I really want to change for Jesus. Just one thing. This examination is not, it's not an essay exam. You can't go on and on and on. It's a short answer. One thing, and maybe briefly why. And I'll give a minute, and then I'll, after a minute, I'll say, okay, now we need to switch, okay? And then the other person will share as well. And then we'll come back and I'll read a verse and we'll take communion together. Does that sound good? Can we do that? So you're going to share the message with one another. So as I pray, I want you to think about your one thing. And then I want you to talk. And I'll give them one minute notice. And the other person will share. And then we'll come back. I'll read a verse. And we'll take the bread and cup together. And we'll have a song. Does that sound good? Let's give it a shot. Let's pray. Father, we really do want our hearts to be soft, to be humble before you. We know, God, you, you, there's a good reason you ask us to examine ourselves. And so, God, is, even as we just sort of reflect for a moment, just on one thing that we really want to maybe take away, one thing we want to reflect on, one thing we want to change, maybe it's something we came in here with that we just want to leave right now at the foot of the cross. But I pray as we are here together and online, as we sit around this massive fellowship table, and we can examine our hearts just a little bit and walk away in sweet fellowship with you, sweet fellowship with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead.
I'm the switch now, so the other person can share one thing. Okay, now here we go. If you can open up your cup. Can I say amen when we get, it'd be great to get rid of these things, amen? The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's break the bread together. I'll give you a moment. I know it's challenging to open that thing sometimes. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death he comes. This is an incredible moment to be around the table fellowship with Jesus. Let's pray and then we'll sing. God, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, so much. Thank you that you give us the strength, the power to change not only that one thing, but the many things we've changed before. To be able to name it so that we can change it so that we can constantly be renewed and transformed more into you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We know we're not worthy. We're so grateful. And help us to really walk away or to, as we gather around this table, to walk away from this table of fellowship with peace and unity and love. For all this in your son, your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing this song. In good times, in bad times, it is well with my soul. That second verse when it says, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. When peace like a
and Lord face the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the
Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is so good to be here. If there were five of us in this audience today, I would feel like this is the greatest honor of my life. And there's about 5,000 of us in this auditorium today. Praise God. You know, this is the opposite of a Zoom worship service, folks, right here. You might say we made it through COVID and here we are. We're back is what some people are saying. My name is A.T. Arneson. This is my wife, Marcy. We are so grateful to be at this point. We're about to cross the finish line on the World Discipleship Summit. Amen? We, uh, we, we, we want to lean into the tape a little bit. If, if some of you thought, are we going to actually have a sermon today? Yes, we're going to have a sermon today. Amen? You know, Marcy and I first arrived into Orlando on July 26th, and that's when we placed membership in the uh, Orlando Church. We'll be moving out on our flight today, but what an amazing time together. Thank you, Sean and Marshall Mead. Thank you for the Orlando Church. What an amazing time. We're, we're, not, just, we're not just closing out a, 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 a conference here. We're, we're having a party today, folks. And this worship team, when, when, the, when the sound went down and everybody in this room started singing, I was like, keep it together, keep it together. I turned to somebody and I said, we have the greatest church on the face of the earth, amen? I mean, it's, it's so wonderful. You know, uh, I want, by way of introduction, I want to put a picture up here of my wife in her natural kind of spiritual state. You can kind of see her there. Yes, we're from Chicago, so greetings from the Midwest family of churches. It's funny, when I took this picture, those wings were not on the mural there. So that just magically appeared. But I want to have Marcy give a, a little bit more of a formal, uh, intimate introduction to who we are. be together and um, hello to everyone streaming and online it's good to see you too you know we did we just wanted to take a moment and introduce ourselves um, you know AT and I have been on a journey together for a long time we actually met as teenagers uh, here we are in at our senior prom <laughs> can any of you my we're my 1980 sisters you know relate to the amount of hairspray that was used yeah I gotta love the 80s um, and for a time, even in high school, we were cheerleading partners. What? Um, yes, uh, we spent several years cheering on the Bettendorf Bulldogs, uh, but now we love cheering on the kingdom of God. Um, we love our fellowship of churches, and we love spurring each other on all the way. You know, on our journey, God has blessed us with two amazing children, Jessica and Stephen. And I just want to thank all of you that have prayed for our family over the past several years, especially. Uh, it's meant so much to us as we've gone through some of our own trials, and we're so grateful for the kingdom of God. Um, as AT has been, prepa been preparing for today's sermon, you know, we've gone on some prayer walks together, and we've just asked God that he would put on AT's heart what to say and how to say it, and that whatever is shared only builds everybody up that listens to it. We're so grateful to be a part of this fellowship. You know, I heard a couple of his points already in the lesson that he's going to be sharing, and I've loved watching when the Spirit has moved him, and he's like, oh, I got another point, and he goes and jots it down, and, and I've just, I know he's so excited, so he's probably ready for me to hand the mic over. Um, but I love being uh, your wife. It's, it's been so fun uh, watching you, and, um, and I pray that we just continue to open up our hearts and have a great time of worship. Love you. Amen. Isn't it great when she can look at me and cry for a good reason after 31 years of marriage? That's a beautiful thing. Let's open our Bibles up to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to get there in just a moment. Today's title is Forward Vision, brothers and sisters. And I, I want to share with you some of my perspectives. Marcy and I just crossed 30 years as disciples of Jesus this past June. My goal today is not to create information overload for all of the classes we've been attending and all of the efforts to preach to us, share with us, and give our testimonies to one another. My goal is to lift up God just a little bit higher in our hearts and in our minds and that we give all that's been invested in us in the last couple of weeks and say, now God, use us in a powerful, powerful way to change the world we're living in. 
And so I don't want us to, to, to feel like we're being overloaded here in this sermon. But, you know, I look back 30 years ago. It was May of 1992. Marcy and I were 23 years old, and we had a one-month-old daughter who was real fidgety and energetic. Anybody have kids like that? Well, in that May 1992 date, we decided to take our fidgety daughter and push her in a stroller out in a mall that was near our apartment in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Unbeknownst to us, a Bible talk was gathering that night, and they didn't have any visitors coming to Bible talk. So the leaders of that Bible talk, Paul and Mary and Beth, said, hey, let's go to the mall and share our faith and see what doors God might open. And so as the mall was closing, Marcy and I were pushing Jessica in her stroller. We couldn't, we were about to walk out the door, but the escalator said no strollers. We turned around, and under that deeply holy ground, under the red hue of the Radio Shack lights, Paul and Mary and Betts pushed their stroller up to us and shared their faith with us. Two and a half weeks later, folks, we were baptized into Christ. Two and a half weeks later, two and a half weeks, a young married couple with a baby was baptized into Christ. And I remember going out into the waters of that South Shore Park there in Milwaukee, into the Lake Michigan waters. And I remember just thinking, this is how you change the world. You get curious about other people's lives, and you are inspired to share your walk with God with them. You know, Paul Betts baptized me, and I came up out of that water, and then I turned and I baptized Marcy, and I like to remind her, I'm the more mature Christian in this equation. And when she came up out of the water, guys, I scooped up my beautiful young 23-year-old bride. She rested her head on my shoulder. I flipped back my wet hair, and lightning streaked across the sky. A wolf howled at a full moon that night. And it was weird because a white stallion showed up on the beach of Lake Michigan, reared back and neighed in unison with that wolf howl. That's what happened in my mind. There were six people at our baptism, and we only knew three of them because we were just ready to go. Cold contact evangelism changed my life. Today, as we examine Genesis chapter 1, the idea here is we need to to move forward with vision, we got to first go backward in the Bible where everything is forward, and that's the easiest chapter to find in your Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And so I want to begin reading here in verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You know, in our fellowship around the world right now, a lot of people are asking, what is our vision, brothers and sisters? But what's really, really important when we read this text, these first opening words of the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The vision that we should explore is not about us. It's always about God, amen? It has always been about God. It is about God at this very moment, and it will always be God at the center of any vision we talk about. You know, Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, its labors labor in vain. Any forward vision we begin to talk about as an international fellowship must put God as the primary glorified one in that equation. We must not have a vision that strokes our egos or lets us plant a flag on some, some, on some mountainous spiritual summit that says, look what we did. Even when we're singing songs, we don't think about how awesome we are. We think about how awesome God is. And I believe there is healing going on in the international churches of Christ. And I believe there is unity being built in the international churches of Christ. But if we lose sight of lifting up God and saying, it's all about you, then we lose our way completely. You guys with me there? You know, as we look at this passage, as we look at this passage here in Genesis chapter 1, I believe as Genesis 1 unfolds, there are patterns and components that God uses and still uses today to introduce us to vision. And I believe if we explore some of these things today, we'll leave here and we'll look at the world through different eyes and say, oh my gosh, that's how God reveals vision. 
Oh, wow, that's how God resets vision. Oh, wow, that's how God inspires vision and has always inspired vision into the hearts of his people. And let me tell you, you look at verse 2 here, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. You know, this is an interesting beginning if we view Genesis 1 as the introduction of humans to God's forward vision. Because God wants to begin with what looks like an impossible situation. An empty void of darkness and nothingness, brothers and sisters. God wants to start with the impossible to show us that with him, all things are possible. Now, I want you guys to know, I get energy from human beings. My wife, she gets depleted. The longer she would stand up here, her little energy bar would keep going down, down, down. Mine just goes up. And so I just, I might be up here forever. Just leave when you feel like it's your time to go. You know, there's this interesting phrase when we start talking about uh, this formless and empty void. It's called tohu wabohu, and we probably have Hebrew scholars in here, and this is one of the most poured over verses and chapters in the Bible, so I'm being a little brave here, one brother. He says, you're brave. Everybody knows Genesis 1, and you're using that as your main text. But you know, tohu wabohu describes chaos and confusion. It's translated here in, in verse 2 as formless and empty. In Isaiah, it's a... It's a Isaiah translates it as confusion and chaos. Jeremiah translated it as wasteland and void. It's only used three times in the Old Testament. The word tohu alone is used 20 times to describe a wasteland, nothingness, a desert place. And why is this important? Because God loves to set the context of his, of his vision in the backdrop of what looks like impossible times to have vision in. God loves the dark, empty void because when the light starts to shine, everybody goes, oh my gosh, look at the illumination of this dazzling thing that God is doing. And I think this is an important thing for us to think about, brothers and sisters, today. Here's the thing. God is never intimidated by chaos and confusion. God is never bothered by chaos and confusion. Go do a Bible study on chaos and confusion in the Bible. When you see the flood of Noah, when you see the confusion of Babel, just make your way through the Bible. And what ends up happening is God is using that moment to reset the vision in people's hearts. Do any of us see anything in the world right now that we would say looks like chaos? I mean, it's so ridiculous, we just start laughing out loud, <laughs> and I'm depressed. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's really funny, bro. I do see it. I, oh, my gosh, my life. And we walk out of here like we drank too much coffee. There's chaos everywhere. And you know, our challenge, brothers and sisters, is we not, must not let our imaginations be more captured by the chaos of the world and the confusion of the world and the problems of the world than we are by the possibility of how God might harness that and do something amazing. God loves to harness emptiness and darkness and voids, and, 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 and he, 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 he says, he, he understands we're going to even have some of those things in the church. Do we have problems in our church? Yes, one of them is named A.T. Arneson. And one of them is named you. We had a man who wanted to be restored in Chicago, and he'd been coming to a number of Sunday worship services, and uh, he walked up to me, and he was very stern, and he was a mature guy, and, and I had preached that day, and he's like, hey, you got problems in your church. And I thought to myself, I have a, a list of 100 problems that I know are in our church, I wonder which one he's identifying. And he pulled me aside in the fellowship. He said, hey, can I talk to you about this? And so I was bracing myself kind of as a ministry person, like, okay, what's he going to say? And you know what he said the problem was in our church? Ushering. Which is true. But it wasn't in the top 100, let me tell you that. I was so relieved when he said that. And the details of thoughtfulness about ushering started to pour out. I mean, the shirts don't match. Those little name tags, they flip down. I can't even read people's names. I don't know who is and isn't an usher. I just see flopsy shirts and flopsy usher name tags. 
you've got to turn this around, AT. And I'm like, you know, I just went with it. I'm like, man, that's terrible. Here's the thing, folks. Anyone in the world can point at a void and say, void. Anyone in the world can point at a problem and say, there's a problem. Anyone can point at darkness and emptiness and go, look at that dark, empty thing over there. It takes special people to look at those things and say, now watch what God might do. Are you guys with me? Can you imagine that when we start looking out at the chaos of the world, the chaos in our own lives, our response is like, not, oh no, it's, oh yes, God is about to show us some part of his vision. Imagine as disciples, we're no longer watching the news fretting and going, what is going on with the world? You know, if you're over 50 years old, you're getting a get off my lawn thing going on inside of you. And you're just like, it wasn't like this when I was a kid kind of thing. You know, this is, this is what we've got to think about. In the absence of God, chaos is just tragedy. In the absence of the presence of God, chaos is, is just suffering through a bitter moment in your life. Don't all of us have a, bi a, a, biogra a biographical narrative about our lives that could read like a tragedy when God isn't in the equation? But you add God to that equation, and all of a sudden it becomes something radically inspiring. You know, at 34 years old, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer that had advanced to the lymph nodes in my neck. At 34, with two young kids, I was thinking, we're going to change the world, we're going to change the world. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to be still and know that he is God. My wife has suffered from debilitating migraines for 25 years. This has been the chaos of our lives. And without God, it reads a bit like a tragedy. But I'm standing before you today as a testimony to say, God is as good as he has ever been. You know, there have been many nights where I've walked home to a darkened home and I hear whimpering somewhere in a corner, even Marcy on the floor in a ball. And I walk in and I know exactly what's happening and I curl up with her and we rock together. And we say, God, bring healing. God, bring healing take the chaos and make it something powerful that testifies to you. Many of you prayed for our son who was caught up walking down the street just with a couple of his buddies a year and a half ago and two cars drove by and, and they were exchanging gunfire and our son was shot at 26 years old through the abdomen and nearly lost his life. I woke up on a Sunday morning at 6 a.m. I was preaching that day and Marcy came frantically running down the stairs saying something happened to Stephen and she's starting to, to burst into a panic. And we didn't know what was going to happen, but as the word got out, thousands and thousands of disciples started praying everywhere. And our son's life was spared. And we, did, we never one time blamed God for anything in any of this. What it served to do for us is refine that baptismal statement. Jesus is Lord. Man, I had to get through that story, folks. That was a rough one. And in the midst of this amazing kind of picture of emptiness, what happens in verse 3? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light uh, day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. You know, what happens is God decides to bring from the chaos and confusion this cohesion and order to things by what? His spoken word, brothers and sisters. When God speaks, chaos is remedied every single time. When God speaks, his word harnesses that energy and turns it into something amazing. Are we a people rooted in the word of God? Amen. Are we a people who, I don't even, I don't, I don't know how to do an electronic Bible when I'm preaching. This is just a big old Bible with a lot of highlights in it. I'm so old school, I've got paper notes with highlights in it, guys. Some of you even have yellow pads out there. That's part of our history. The power of God, when the power of God meets chaos, the power of God's word wins every single time. When we're watching the news, we see chaos. When we're watching social media and we see chaos, 
what we should think instinctively is, man, God's word's got to go out from this place. We've got to believe in the power of God's word. You know, this refrain happens nine times, and I, I, I like doing it in different voices, different emphasis. And God said, and God said, and God said, and you just do it nine times, and God said is the refrain over and over, because when God speaks into chaos, amazing things start to happen, and it happens in our own lives too. The word of God transforms people's hearts. Now, I want to say something that I think is very important. This is my conviction. If the problems of the world could be solved by the world, they would already be solved. If the problems of the world could be solved by the world, they would already be solved. Think about the resources devoted to solving the problems of morality, the problems with culture and diversity, the problems associated with race, inequity, poverty, oppression, hate, violence, all the evil acts. Think about the educational hours devoted to solving these problems, but the more people you add to the equation, the more complex and spiraling downward do those problems become, brothers and sisters. Why? Because you're trying to solve a problem that only God can solve through the power and guidance of his words. How's everybody doing out there? Come on. I, I love it. I love the word of God. You know, our job is not to solve the problems of the world, but to bring God's word as a light into the darkness of those problems. You know, I grew up in the church where I was like, wow, we are a people that value the transformative and visionary power of God's word. When I came into the church in 1992, the building was terrible. Uh, the singing was okay. There was like two people on a stage, just it looked like they volunteered last minute. It wasn't super organized. There wasn't even a plant on the stage, folks. And I came into the church for the very first time, and I saw open Bibles. I saw people enthousi enthusiastic. They announced three baptisms, and the whole crowd just stood up and enthusiastically just cheered for those three new disciples in Jesus. And I was just moved to tears within minutes of walking into that fellowship. We have a history of loving God's Word. We had a meeting the other day among the Chicago leadership, and the, the meeting was, do people still have quiet times? Because we need that daily devotional to keep transforming. I'm not talking about check the box of seven quiet times a week. I'm saying we are immersed in the power, and God said. You know, I've had the privilege of preaching in some amazing places. If you go to Jakarta and Tokyo and you preach in the facility that rises above you, it'd be like all of us, but like four stories high, you know what I mean? And it's like you're being enveloped by disciples and you're preaching and you get done and the lines are like an hour and two hour long. We always say it's like the closest thing to being a rock star in the kingdom of God, preaching a sermon in Jakarta or in Tokyo or in Singapore. One time I was preaching in an open air auditorium in one of the regions of the Johannesburg Church. And I was thinking, man, these folks love the Bible because in the first 15 minutes, the, the energy in the room was so high, I was like, this is uncontainable. And then the power in the whole building went out. The keynote went down, uh, the speaker system no longer worked, and, and then I was like, well, hey, we gave it our best shot. And someone from the audience yelled, keep going, bro. Like, but we don't have power. And they're like, preach. And then there was this, preach, preach, preach. And a bro and a brother was like, just get to the edge of the stage and just start yelling as loud as you can. And we finished that sermon, and it was so energetic, kind of like our singing today, guys. It was amazing. They love the Word of God. The first time I was ever translating this sermon was in a 17-hour train ride from Kiev to Donetsk, Ukraine. And I showed up just in time to do a midweek lesson, and Marcy and I were there, and this brother, Pasha Golub, was translating, and I, I was a young minister at the time, and so I brought my one lesson, I did my midweek, it was nine o'clock, and the final amen, and the crowd was just dead silent. Sixty disciples just looking at me, blink, blink. I'm like, what's going on? Pasha goes down in the crowd, and they said, he comes back, he's like, they want another lesson. I'm like, no, midweek is, midweek is three songs, welcome, prayer. Announcement, lesson, prayer, done. It's 9 o'clock. Everybody knows that. 
These disciples didn't get the message, folks. And I was like, but I don't have another message. Pasha goes, do you have a Bible? I'm like, yeah, I got a Bible. Flip over to verse 26. We're making our way here, folks. I love our fellowship so, so much. I love that we love the Word of God. You know, as you make your way through Genesis, and there's no way we have time to, to explore all of the ins and outs, and many of you have done that. You're listening to podcasts. You're doing all kinds of things to get into some of these great Old Testament texts. But one thing is really important to note as we kind of make our way to the full introduction of the vision, and it's this, is that God is almost showing off in this creation account. And God said, and then this thing pops up, and then God said, and that thing pops up. And you know what's so amazing is one author said, we serve a prodigal God. He's a God of abundance, not a God of scarcity. We worship a God who's over generous and doesn't have a credit limit on his resources. He's a God that doesn't budget himself. He just pours out and pours out and pours out. And the creation account is the best example of God's unlimited, abundant energy coming to full fruition before our eyes. You know, God is, uh, you, you look at the, na the, the, the account of nature coming to fruition. Nature is teeming. It's fertile. It's overabundant. Some might even say wasteful. Jesus tells parables about a farmer. What kind of farmer takes seed and just throws it wherever it may land? It's demonstrating this is how God thinks. But you know, sometimes we as human think in scarcity, not in abundance. And so as you read this creation account, you see nature teeming, you see the fertility, you see millions of species, you see billions of seeds. Everything is a seed-bearing plant. He even creates humans with 90% more brain capacity than we can apparently use. And some of us use even less than that. I'm not, no names, I'm just saying, right? Wives are looking at their husbands, yes, it's true. I don't think we'll ever fathom God's vision thinking in terms of scarcity, brothers and sisters. I am so grateful that the Orlando Church persevered to bring us together in this spirit. Because this is a demonstration of abundance. This is what happens when people pour it out and say, give God something to bless. Let me spend some money and take my kids and go to this thing that's really expensive and really far away, and maybe God will do something great. That's the spirit of the God that we serve, brothers and sisters. You know, God is the opposite of stingy. He's the opposite of miserly. He's the opposite of frugal. God loves the woman who breaks the alabaster jar of perfume and anoints Jesus' feet. Why? Because she's living in scarcity and thinking in abundance. She's like, you know what? This is the best that I have. I'm going to break it open, and I'm going to pour it on Jesus, and people are going to think I'm crazy, but I want to think like God. When the poor widow throws in those two copper coins into a corrupt giving system, she is acting in the abundant faithfulness of an abundant God, brothers and sisters. You know, I think we got we to gotta understand we'll never grasp the full magnitude of how God wants to bless us with a vision and participation in this vision if we're thinking in terms of limitation when God thinks in abundance. You know, I think it's really important for us that we, we begin to convince ourselves not with, let's see what's going to happen. We'll see what happens from this, but what won't we see if we really give God something to bless? You know, I love going on walks with, uh, with Mars, and um, she's got this thing she loves to do. If we're going through a hard time, she wants to turn to the abundant nature of God for whatever that particular thing is. If she's sick, God is abundant healer. If she's tired, God is our source of power. If we're, if we're feeling like we're kind of thin financially, God will bless us in an amazing way. If we're lacking joy, God is our source of joy. And Marcy came up with this idea. She goes, can we go on walks and talk in this kind of framework of already but not yet? I think she invented this because I've never heard anybody else talk about it. But she said, can we talk as if the things we hope for have been abundantly blessed by God? And I'm like, well, like, what does that mean? She goes... So anything you hope happens, let's talk like it's already true in our lives. 
I'm like, you mean like, man, I'm really ripped for 75 years old? She's like, yeah, stuff like that. But she goes, but let's be more spiritual about it, amen? That's why she has the angel wings behind her, you know what I mean? But what's so funny is, is we start talking like this, and sometimes I get lost in the conversation. Like, she'll be like, can you believe so-and-so became a Christian and all that they're doing to serve God? And then she starts naming grandchildren we don't have yet. The other day, she's like, man, little Dylan is really growing up, and we're in the middle of this conversation. And then she goes, Dylan is really growing up. I'm like, who's Dylan? She's like, our grandchild. We have a grand... What, what am I missing here? It's really hard to follow a hope conversation like that, guys. You know, I think we got to kill a scarcity mindset in our hearts, brothers and sisters. You know what? We're not being held back because we don't have enough people, money, places, time, education, teachers, evangelists, elders. That's not what's holding us back. What's holding us back is we got to be like the woman who does break the jar and says, God, I'm giving you something magnify it in tremendous, tremendous ways. We have no scarcity problems in the international churches of Christ. By the time we get to verse 26, we see this amazing thing happen. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea, and it goes on and on. You know, the creation account up to this point has been kind of a, I don't mean this... <laughs> God, I don't mean this in a blasphemous way, but it's been kind of a point and shoot. Let there be light. Bam, there's light. Let there be stars in the sky. Let there be a light that governs the day and a light. It's all this let there be. It's like boom, boom, boom. But by the time we get to verse 26, God is honing in on something much more intimate. Let us make. And what's happening here in my mind is God is about to introduce this amazing vision for everything he's created. And like we said in the beginning, it's God's vision, brothers and sisters. And so we read in verse 27, so God created man and his own mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And so this is the culminating moment of introducing God's vision for everything that's gone on from verse 1 until right here. Can I get an amen on that? Can you imagine? God has created all of this, and he says, and then I'm going to make image bearers, and they're going to make image bearers, and they're going to make image bearers, and all of this is going to be handed over to these image bearers, and they're going to fill it up, and we're going to walk in harmony and, and eternal glory in this great rela intimate relationship with God. Fill the earth. I was thinking if God gave us a piece of cake and said, eat it, we'd know exactly what he was talking about. Or if God handed us the keys to a car and said, drive it, we'd be like, got it, I know what the vision is. Or maybe better, if God handed you a bucket of money and said, it's yours, I made it, spend it, you'd be like, yahoo, I know exactly what the vision is. But all of creation is now hanging out there in this beautiful spectacle with these image bearers that God says, go and fill it up. You know what's so interesting? This isn't about creating just a population base of numbers of people we can count, brothers and sisters. Because I think God knows that if they're really image bearers, the earth gets filled with all of his amazing attributes as the image bearers begin to populate the planet. So it's not just numbers of people that impress us. In a room like this, it's not just that there's 5,000 people here, it's that there's 5,000 loving people here that there's 5,000 forgiving people here. It's that there's 5,000 people who would lay their lives down for each other here. That's what makes this room special. It's a world filled up not just with people, but filled with love. Stadiums are filled with people, and they fight and get drunk and cuss at each other. It's not the number of people. It's what those people represent as image bearers to God. And so from the very beginning, the forward vision is fill the earth, and as an image bearer, you fill the earth with all of the glorious things that show how good God is. 
Fill it with love, fill it with faith, fill it with laughter, fill it with joy, absent of anxiety, absent of depression, fill it with partnership, fill it with great marriages, fill it with children who stand on a stage and squeak out an amazing song and we're all weeping going, there's hope for the future, folks. See, I'm gaining energy as this day goes on. I grew up in a time where disciples went to the most dangerous places on earth to change the chaos and the problems. I grew up hearing stories about planting a diverse church in, in an apartheid-governed South Africa. And, and, you know, when apartheid fell, you know, we knew that the governments were at work and there were personalities involved in that. I actually thought it was because disciples were there with the church as a young girl. I'm like, that's what happens when you go there as a disciple. When, 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 when uh, we planted the church in Moscow, uh, Russia, I was like, oh my gosh, communism's teetering. You know why? Because there's disciples there. It makes sense. The Berlin Wall came down because there must have been a disciple there one day. I know that's spiritually naive, but prove to me otherwise, folks. Come up to me and say, that's not true. It was something else. No, and I'll say, no, it is true, and we'll be in this argument that we can never prove each other right or wrong. You know what I mean? I grew up, when the Kiev church was planted, three days before Marcy and I were baptized into Christ, three days before we were baptized into Christ, the Kiev church had their inaugural service, and we were taking up special missions. I was a one and a half week old Christian. Marcy and I gave $347 to special missions. And you know why I know it was 347 Because I had 352 in my account. And I needed to leave $5 because I have a child and a wife. We might need a carton of milk before the week is over. You know what I mean? But I was like, this is the world I grew up in. But you know what? It's the world we're living in right now because that's still how disciples are, guys. This fill the earth mentality. I'm so grateful the pioneers of our fellowship went out, not just up in big columns of churches. We are in 700, we're 731 congregations in 147 nations. What a special fellowship to be a part of. The last thing I want to recognize here in this Genesis chapter 1 is there's another refrain that I think most of us are familiar with. And it's the refrain that says, and God said, followed by that second refrain, and God saw. God said, and God saw. And what did God see after God said? He saw that it was good. He saw that it was good. When we leave here, and we go back to our churches, will we carry the goodness of this moment and that perspective from God back into all of our congregations? For those listening online, do we look at our fellowship and think, wow, this is so good. You know what? God calls good what God calls beautiful. We as a people must call good and must call beautiful. I still wake up on a Sunday and I'm just like, oh, we get to go be with the disciples. 30 years into this journey, it's not wearing off on me. I think our fellowship is so beautiful. We are the bride of Christ. Are we the only bride of Christ? No, but we're part of the bride of Christ. I've done so many weddings where that bride comes around that corner, and we've all been there, right? Or those doors flip open, and there she is. You know, my words as a minister are, all rise. And everybody rise, rises in honor and respect of that beautiful bride, perfectly prepared to be received by her husband standing there. So when I say all rise, everybody stands up and I go like this to the groom. Because I'm like, what's he going to do? And you know what he does 90% of the time? He starts crying at the beauty before him. Now I want you to imagine the person in that standing now moment at a wedding yelling, man, that is one ugly bride. <laughs> Dang. Look at the teeth on her. You know what I mean? This is where I get in trouble. I'm off script right now, so that's not good. But <laughs> what, would the, what would the entire audience do if someone just shouted that out? We'd grab that guy and throw him out of the wedding. You're out of here, dude. What would we do if that person was live chatting on social media? Saying, man, this is one ugly bride at this wedding. I'm going to check me out, selfie. You know what I mean? No, that would be equally wrong and inappropriate. 
We have a saying in Chicago um, that we're teaching the staff that after every social media post or after every conversation, end it with this thought. In Jesus' name I say. That when I put up a post on social media, I close it out with this phrase, in Jesus' name I say. If you're on the ICOC Facebook page, in Jesus' name I say. You write something negative, in Jesus' name I say. You are never not an ambassador for Christ as a Christian. You are never not representing Jesus. You are never alone on your social media. Never. You're always representing Jesus as a Christian. Always representing Jesus as a Christian. Brothers and sisters, we must steer clear of negativity about the bride of Christ in our fellowship. And it so, doesn't mean we can't critique, we can't say things, we can't go to leadership and say, the ushering stinks in your church. But I'm telling you, this Lone Ranger posting negative things about the Bride of Christ, we got to defend the Bride of Christ. And yet still know we've got a lot of growth to become like Jesus in the journey ahead. Amen? In Jesus' name I say. I want to close with a picture that is one of my favorite pictures. And, uh, and I call this picture, and it'll pop up on the screen, I call it God's vision for her. This is a picture that's going to come onto your screen of the day my mama was baptized into Christ. Thank you. And I saw that it was beautiful. Ten years prior to this particular moment when Marcy and I were baptized, we were actually not planned, but we were baptized on her birthday. And I thought that was God saying she's going to be baptized in a couple of weeks. But it would take 10 years to get from that moment to this moment. But she was begging us to get out of this radical church that made no sense. You just go to church on Sundays. What are you guys getting involved in? Anybody else have an experience like that? When Marcy and I a year later went into the ministry, she begged us, weeping, begged us, you are making the mistake of your life. And so then I knew the journey was going to be long. But through a series of, of different events, my mom began to open up, and sisters really got in there with her, and she began to study the Bible. And this is the moment that she had, I'm, I'm standing in the foreground, and this is the moment that I asked her that, that really important question, what is your good confession? She said, Jesus is Lord, and that's the picture that was snapped at that moment. And I was so pumped because she didn't know 10 years prior God had a vision for her life. And when you boil down a fill the earth vision, it really comes down to a moment like this, brothers and sisters, that God has a vision for all of our mothers, for all of our families, for all of our neighbors, where they're standing there in this moment going, Jesus is Lord, and they will one day enter eternity vision fulfilled. That's really what it was all about. We didn't know at this time, but my mom only at 59 years old would pass away from a devastating ovarian cancer diagnosis. She was a disciple for eight years. We had no idea at this moment what was coming our way. But you know, in the last two years of her life, she was determined to share her faith with anybody she could get her hands around. Anybody who would listen. All of her family members. I was like, who is this woman? I kept going, remember when you didn't like us? Remember when you didn't like the church? One time she was standing on a stage doing a communion message right near the end of her life and she was wearing a wig because of the radiation and the treatment. And we're all just sitting there and we're kind of blubbering and we're, we're, we're just inspired by her. And she goes, what am I doing? And she rips the wig off and throws it into the audience and she goes, I'm a daughter of God. And I was like, yes, that is the vision, guys. That is the vision. I think about the fact that she crossed that finish line to an irreversible hope. And it drives me to share my faith with as many people as possible still 30 years later. I don't know if you guys know this, but right now there's a plan that in August of the year 2072, 50 years from now, there's gonna be another conference right here in Orlando. Marshall will be dead by then, so it won't matter. You know what I mean? He, 
Sorry, Marshall. No, you'll be alive. You'll be alive. You'll be alive. If this doesn't kill him, that would kill him. But in 2072 in Orlando, there's going to be a conference, conference and it's called Looking Back, Looking Forward. And what they're going to do is they're going to grab clips from this Sunday worship service. It's from some of the classes. And they're going to show the disciples 50 years from now, this is what got us to this moment. Isn't it amazing that we're now a million members around the world from every nation on planet Earth because there was a people who believed in God's forward vision. And some of your children will be the elders of elders like uh, Pat Gempel and Al Baird. They'll be the elders of those churches in that particular moment. And they will look back at us and know we had forward vision because of all that they're experiencing at that hour. Brothers and sisters, it is a beautiful thing to be in the fellowship of God's family. Let's lift God high, honor him with our lives, and break that alabaster jar of perfume and give God something to bless. Love you. Thank you, A.T. Arneson. Please be seated. I love A.T. and Marcy. I thank you guys so much for your support and our partnership in the last five years of putting this conference together and serving on the Catalyst team and, and being a fierce defender and supporter of this family of churches. Like A.T., I, I just... I just love our family. I love the ICOC family of churches. You know, my parents were married in 1961. And like the Zillmans, they just kept having children. So there were five of us siblings that all grew up in one house in Colorado. And each one of us in our bedrooms had a shrine to our individual likes. But every night, my mom would make the most amazing meal and all seven of us would gather around the table and we would have supper and we would laugh. And even though we were so different, you couldn't have made seven more different people, we came to the table as family. And here in the ICOC, we spent the last couple of years in our bedrooms building shrines and expounding on our differences. And we were witnesses of chaos, and some of us added to that chaos. But for this week, finally we came and sat down at the supper table. And we realized that we are and always will be a part of God's amazing family. We are sons and daughters of the King, and when we look at each other, we're like, we are truly brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, I have heard that at least four people have been baptized into Christ since the conference began at our the hotel pools. So like my dad, who just had to add another bedroom every time they had another child, Christ is in heaven right now preparing four new rooms for four new souls that were added. And here's what I want to leave us with. You know, really only about a tithe of our international fellowship conference attended this conference in any way, whether it was in person or online, and got to experience this family supper. And so just as a little negative yeast can work through a whole batch of dough, brothers and sisters, may we return to our churches and be that positive leaven that provides encouragement and faith for our family in Christ and hope for the needy communities and love for the lost world that they might know the grace and mercy that we have all found in Christ. Amen? Now for some closing announcements before our final song. If you would like to serve 
this church and at the same time grab a souvenir please help your don't go chaotic right now don't add to the chaos but all those banners out there again i don't want to take them home don't just grab the banner though if you grab a banner you have to take that stand the bag is already there you can fold it up you can take it home if you can get it through the airport security or you can throw the uh, stand out later at a dumpster way far away the other people that do not want to go home with anything is IPI publishers. Please stop by the book table and, uh, and, and really just loot them of whatever supplies they have left. I'm not saying they're all free, but they do have some freebies and some discounts, and they want to get rid of that stuff. I have a few thank yous uh, as we close out. I'm reminded of Nehemiah chapter 3 that feels like a boring chapter because all Nehemiah does is just list all the people that helped him build the wall. Those names mean nothing to me, but I know they meant everything to Nehemiah. And so the list of names I'm about to read, they may not mean anything to you, but they mean so much to me, including just even the, the uh, Performing Arts Camp from Hope and Shining Stars that brought about in one day the amazing performance that you saw this morning. I want to thank all our sponsors and exhibitors who really put on a fantastic exhibitor experience out there. You guys were so engaged with them, and I'm so thankful for each and every one that came and invested in this conference. I'm so thankful for partner churches that, that knew this was a difficult time. I can't list them all, but, but some really stepped up in a great way and just said, we have your back. We'll buy this, we'll support that, we'll buy virtual, we'll do whatever we can. We'll support you, we'll sponsor you, uh, we'll provide translation. Here's money, use it for however you see fit. Thank you in advance, and this list might grow after the conference, so we'll just see how that turns out. <laughs> I want to thank you for the service teams. They really are the ones who planned the conference and all the speakers and, and really dreamed and had a vision for what you would receive. I'm sure those lessons were amazing. I can't wait to go home and start watching them. AT, that was the first. No, I saw Luz and Angel as well. But guys, thank you to all the, the service teams that put these conferences together. I want to thank the worship teams for all of their work as well. That was amazing. It was crazy. I felt really led to the presence of God. I'm just so thankful for the moments I had to experience what heaven must be like uh, here on earth. Amen. Thank you for everybody on that list and the work and, and, and many more that are not on these lists. I want to thank you for our event staff. I just made up titles for you. I have no idea what you did. I just know that Tony Fernandez did everything, that Winston Battino did everything, that Emily Vogel did everything. I want to thank Custom Reg for the uh, registration and all that they did. Uh, we are now on our fifth lyrics person because people are getting, uh, it's just, it's wear we're wearing out. So thank you. Thank you for our translation services. Thank you for the, uh, uh, the sign language, the American Sign Language. has. Uh, we hired interpreters. Thank you so much for the work that they have done at the uh, uh, American Sign Language. I want to thank AV Matters for all that those guys have done. These guys have not only blown it out here, these are the same guys that come early and set up the sound at my service every Sunday. It's not as loud as it is here, but it's as professional. And I, I cannot thank Mike and Donna enough, Richard Runge, Ted, our show producer, Chris Vasquez, Stan and Josh, who kind of envisioned and built this stage. I had no idea. I was going to go on Amazon last week and like, do I need to buy some stuff for the stage? And Richard's like, it'll be fine. I came and I was like, this is amazing. He's like, you didn't know? I was like, no, but it's amazing. I thank Conference Direct, our partners, especially our event manager, Christy Norcross, for all the work that she has done with us for the last four years. 
Charles Bellow, Anna, Erica, and all the Conference Direct staff. It's the only reason I'm barely standing right now. Uh, I want to thank the media team. Hans Rasmussen has been such a great friend to me. David Witt is doing all the audio recordings. Those will be up and have a home that you'll get to hear all the lessons. Cassandra and many others that did social media. Susan Wadeen was a rock star putting all that app and everybody on there and helping everybody that didn't know how to put it on there. She, she came through in an amazing way. And then the Orlando Church. Too many names to mention, but really everything that was happening with your kids was under the umbrella of Mike and Cindy Morris. Bringing Nicole and Andrea on the Inclusive Impact Summit Lounge for children with special sensitivities and abilities was amazing. The entire Giant Cow staff, the Kid Zone, Michelle, and the, the volunteers did such a great job. I want to thank our Hope Chapter Director, J.J. Lullen, for the two-day project that he put together. I want to thank the prayer team that was praying for us day and night at this conference and took thousands of prayer requests from you, and we'll still pray for you. Paul and Lorene Sadler for the volunteer management that they did. Paul took a week off of Disney. I mean, he gets to go from here back to Disney, so he goes from chaos to chaos. Paul loves chaos. That's his full-time job. And thank you guys and all of the volunteers from both the Orlando Church and just everybody who flew out here, paid for the conference, put on a shirt, and then just served. You're crazy. I want to thank our board president, Jeff, Eddie, our vice president. I want to thank Anita Price and Jen Poole, our administrators. They have been angels. And they have been attacked by demons at time in the form of a Christian who is having a bad day. I want you to say a special prayer for those two because they have been amazing. I want to thank Bill Boyles for our legal team here. And again, maybe his work is just starting, I don't know, but uh, he has helped us a lot. <laughs> And he and his wife were on the original church planting from Gainesville to the Orlando Church of Christ and are still serving this congregation 40 plus years later. I want to thank Jose Ferrer that opened our store and did all our merchandise and printing. Brian Santos, the director of all, and Michelle, international registrations. We tried everything to get as many disciples from overseas as we could. Bill Ellis for the translation for the Spanish track. Terry Schultz, our guest support, uh, just answering questions over and over again, amen? Because it was my conference, I got to use my brother, one of my best friends, to do all of our artwork. He is such a genius. He's, he's done many other logos for the ICOC. And then I put New Belgium up there because that's one of his favorite and most uh, well-known logos. He's there in Colorado as well. But uh, just working with my brother on the artwork was so amazing. I'm just so thankful for him. I want to thank the ICOC, again, my family, for your prayers and support. I felt this week a sense of how much people have prayed for us and have supported us during this time. I really did. I told people I feel like I could jump off the Temple Mount and I would have been okay. I would have been caught. I didn't do that because Jesus didn't, and so I want to be like him. But I thank you guys so much for your prayers and support. I want to thank my family. Uh, you can come up here if you want. Because... I know this was not easy on them. So I want to thank my kids because I haven't, some of this spills over, believe it or not, into parenting. Uh, and so there have been times when I'm just like, not now. I'm responding to an email that's important. And my own child is right there. And uh, so amen. I'm looking forward to getting reacquainted with my family and, and my bride. And I thank my wife so much for just her support and love for me during this time. Amen. And I think lastly, um, I just want to thank God because he is the 
worst person to plan an event with because he never responds to email or texts and I never know what he's gonna do and I feel like I was in a group project with somebody that never turned in his assignment in 2020 and then we failed and then it took us two more years to graduate and I'm like when are we gonna But I spent a good time of 2020 being on a different page than God, and that was really hard. And I felt much more at peace when I repented and just got on to his rhythm and his plan and his wisdom. And Tina, your song ministered to me today. That was a song that I've never heard before, but it was written and performed for me, I believe. Because now one thing I know, and that one thing I have found, is that God will work it out. Amen? Thank you, guys. We're gonna take a second here because Marshall kept saying, I wanna thank, I wanna thank. And in just a moment, we're gonna, we're gonna change that to we, and you're gonna have an opportunity to show your gratitude. Marshall has been the mayor of the ICOC, it feels like, for the last seven years. I've been a disciple for 41 years. My name's Mike Tolliver, and I'm the evangelist in San Antonio with my wife, Amber Jean, here. Amen. We hosted the first one 10 years ago. And many of you came. Who came to San Antonio 10 years ago? God bless you. And now Marshall and Sean, they picked up, they picked up the torch seven years ago and they said, we're going to plan this thing. And they have done nothing. Marshall has done nothing but think about where you are going to sleep, what you're going to eat, will you be safe, uh, will you have a class, an auditorium, will there be sound, will there be AV. He thought about the pre-meetings you might go to, the books you might want to buy, the services you might need, a doctor just in case. He thought about, about if you lost something, where would you go and retrieve it, he endured all the pressure and all the problems and all the personalities, and he did all this because he loves God and he loves all of us. And I just want to say to Sean, because so often, I mean, we, when we went through it, I know what that's like. And your grace and strength and incredible support and all of the things that none of us will ever see and how you supported your husband and your family through a lot of difficult moments. And uh, you deserve all the praise as well. So whether you are here in this auditorium or you are watching with us, and many congregations are watching with us around the world right now, this is now your moment to make it known to Marshall and to God how thankful we are. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, before we close out in song, Everybody wants to know. Who's the next lucky guy or girl or city? I'm here to tell you, drum roll please. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
God only knows where our next North America or World Discipleship Summit will be. I kept threatening church leaders that if somebody doesn't get that announcement to be by Sunday, I'm just picking you. But guys, we are in talks, yet right now, God knows the plans that he has for us. Let's stand and let's close in a final song. Death in the grave is overcome. Let's all sing that.
great time in fellowship.